This is the Anabet. It actually it looks like an old kind of clunky piece of technology, but it's actually um, the newest model of this. Um, this part is just purely to um, he be able to hear the calls. It can also record the calls if you put a flash card in here. Um, but this is what we use. If you turn it on, it can record. It's probably picking up insect noise or just other kinds of high frequency noises. So it picks up other things other than bats. One of the problems is that in the summertime when you're listening to bats it'll also pick up katydids. So you'll have a lot of background noise and you have to mess with the sensitivity and try to make sure you can get it so you can record bats mostly. Um, we have the version that also has a PDA associated with it and um, I'll hook it up later but I'll just show you that basically the PDA um, hooks to the Anabat and it allows you to get a visual of the call on the screen. Also when you're using the PDA the calls are actually recorded on here and then you can download them later to your computer to analyze them with Analook software. So you basically can use this in the field and kind of as an active monitoring tool. You would have this out maybe while you were misnetting or just walking around doing Anabat surveys or driving around listening and recording the calls of species. Um, it helps you to be able to get um, some of the species you may not catch in mist nets when you're doing surveys. Also get an idea of how many bats are using an area if there's a lot of activity. You can't really count the number of bats, but you can get an idea of whether there's a lot of activity. The same bat might be flying over and over again, so you'll get that over and over again. But um, basically there's a little stand that hooks up to this and then you can just listen and record the calls at night. and. Um, I also have a GPS card that goes in it so I can record the location of each call that I record. So that's really helpful that way if I'm doing a driving survey or something I don't have to constantly have a GPS with me taking points while I'm recording. I can do it at the same time with this so that's really cool. All of the species we have minus one I think is in this booklet and there's an extra one or two in here. But it's basically showing you what, what the sonogram looks like when you look at it in Analook after you record bat calls. This is a free tail bat, and you can see that this is kind of showing the range of different calls you might get when you record. Usually you look at frequency to tell differences between groups of bats. This bat tends to be between 20 and 25k, and um, that's kilohertz. And it's, it's occasionally going below, but this bat can have many different types of calls and can be hard to identify. And it can overlap with other calls in the area. We don't have that bat. Here's um, one of the species that we're looking for today, the Raffinesse Big-Eared Bat. And um, this call has um, dual harmonics, I believe is what it's called. And it, it can, so it can basically be calling at different frequencies kind of at the same time or really close together. And it's really difficult to tell between this and some other species to get a good call that says that this is a Raffinesse Big-Eared Bat. And actually Matt has been having trouble actually picking up Raffinesse Big-Eared Bats when he was doing work with them in the swamp. So he hasn't had very good luck doing acoustic surveys for Raffinesse Big-Eared Bats. Um, some of the species are really easy to tell apart and some are harder. So you can basically kind of group them into groups. Bats that are calling maybe like between 40 and 50 kilohertz. Bats that are below 20 are usually hoary bats. We don't have um, many species that have low frequency calls. And if I can find that one, oh here it is, you can see that it'll get above 20 but the calls that are below are basically, if you get a call like that you're usually going to call it a hoary bat. So that's our biggest bat and that one tends to have the lowest frequency calls. It's really hard to tell when you look at the screen which species you have, especially when we have cluttered calls kind of like that. It could be different things. So you, oftentimes you can get a general idea of what species you might have but you'll go back and look in the program, the Analook software, and compare it to a call library of known calls that you have, and that helps you to identify them. So it has a bunch of different buttons, but really, mostly what you're concerned is to turn it on. You're going to have, while we're doing the um, active monitoring, you're going to have it on the record mode. You can also leave this in a waterproof container and like leave it overnight and record passively. So you could record on, on a stream or on a road all night long or maybe just a trail. 
and get calls of bats in that area. And a lot of times when graduate students or other people are doing research, that's what they'll do. We may do that at some point when, if we have more than one unit especially, we can leave some out at night. You have to be careful because you want to camouflage it. You don't want anybody to steal it. These things are pretty expensive. The whole setup, I think, was a little over $2,000. I'm not sure how much these are alone. The PDA costs some extra money too. But, um, and this is the sensitivity, so you can turn it up or down. You kind of want to mess with that while you're listening to it. So if the KDG get, dids get too loud, you can turn it down, but and you can turn it back up if you're not hearing too much. And you can control the volume and things like that. So it's basically, it's recording in this microphone, and then you're hearing the sound coming out of here, and it records the call of the bat at the high frequency, kind of reduces the frequency to an audible level that humans can hear. And that's, that's basically what this basic unit is meant to do. And then um, it's been updated since it was developed. So now you can record just with this unit before you had to have a separate unit to record. Or you can record on the PDA, which is what I do most of the time. And it hooks up to the PDA here. So that's basically what it is. It's just run on batteries. And um, it's pretty rugged. You can't get it wet. Um, that's probably the... Well, you can have some sprinkles on it. I mean, this is fairly waterproof, but probably the biggest limiting thing is that you can't get water in the microphone. So that's tough when you're out doing work on streams, and you, maybe if you want to leave it out all night, so you have to put a special box up so that it doesn't get wet at night. And the PDA is definitely not waterproof, so that's a little bit more sensitive equipment. But this is pretty hardy, I guess. Some people leave it out year-round for monitoring, and they'll just come and download things or have um, solar-powered battery backup that will keep recharging it and have a big unit that will store calls. And they may leave it up year-round, and some people have left it in the desert and it's able to withstand those kind of heats. So it's fairly rugged when it comes to that. But, but this is the main piece of equipment that we use to listen to bat calls. Well, um, when you are trapping bats in the field, it's really high, it's really kind of takes a lot of effort. And um, you have to put up nets, you have to come out before dark and set up nets, find a good spot, and then you have to stay up with the nets, and sometimes you don't catch anything. It's really hard to tell where there's going to be high bat activity and where there's not. And sometimes, um, because we're limited in the places we do surveys, we're normally surveying on state lands. We may not have a very good trapping site on one of our WMAs or one of our natural areas. We just have to find the best site we can. There may not be any bats flying there regularly on the stream at the level where we would catch them in our nets. Um, you may see some flying overhead while you're netting and bats easily avoid nets. You kind of have to trick them to come into nets they can see and they can use echolocations to find your net. On a m night with a, a lot of moonlight, they'll really see the nets. If it's windy and the nets are moving, they'll see them more. So it's hard to catch them, and it and it takes a lot of effort. With this, you can. Uh, this is great to have out with you when you're doing mist netting, so that you can listen to the bats that you are missing that you're not catching in the net. Then you have two things to look at: both your your captures in your mist net and your calls that you recorded on the anabat to find out what species are in the area. And you can basically just get a presence still with this. You're just saying, I know these species are here based on the calls and captures, but I'm not sure what's what we didn't get that might still be here. And even though you can record some calls, some species are so hard to identify that you can't really say for sure you had that species. By looking at the call you can say it suspiciously looks like a certain species and if we go, if we we're interested in that species, say it's a federally listed species like the Indiana bat, we can go back and try to capture bats at that site for, you know, several times to see if we could potentially get an Indiana bat in a mist net and confirm that we did have that call on the Anabat. So it really helps us to get more information.